Great to see all of you this morning. Thank you so much for being a part of our services here at Washington Lions Church, whether you're with us in person or online. We are so glad to have you. Uh, we're going to continue our study in the book of Matthew. If you have your Bibles this morning or your devices, would you please open up to Matthew chapter 1. We're going to finish that out, uh, put a finger there, and then move over two books to your right to Luke chapter 1. We're going to touch uh, on that a little bit as well. We'll kind of link a couple passages together, Matthew 1 and Luke chapter 1. Now, we really want you to be in God's Word this morning. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, uh, scoot up beside somebody who does. Uh, it's okay. I don't know if we're, we're past, kind of past that six feet now. Maybe get within three feet where you can still kind of look over their shoulder. But no, we do have Bibles in the back uh, for you. If you don't have one, we would love for you to either borrow it this morning or preferably take it home with you. Uh, we want everybody to have a copy of God's Word so uh, you can kind of see uh, what the Lord is saying as we kind of unpack that this morning. Matthew 1, Luke chapter 1. While you're uh, opening up to that, uh, let me give you just a couple uh, quick uh, announcements, one in particular really, just to be continually praying for uh, our leadership team here, our building team, as we seek the Lord and what is next for our building. Uh, you'll know back at our annual meeting in December, we approved uh, the spending of uh, money to bring, bring in an architect, to hire an architect, to really look at these couple phases that we outlined to you, some internal work here, a, a new structure, a new building outside, and we're trusting the Lord. We, uh, this, this project that we're praying about, that you're praying with us, is a project that would meet needs of the youngest child to the oldest adult and do even more within our community. And so we're really excited about it at our uh, elders retreat back in uh, Jan January, February. Uh, I can't remember. It was, it was a couple, a month or so ago. Uh, we spent a lot of time in prayer about that, uh, prayer leading up to that, talking about that. Our building team has been meeting with the architects, uh, also meeting with engineers uh, about this as well. And so uh, we just want you to be praying with us. Uh, the, the building team is going to be putting some videos together and some pictures, and we're going to be uh, getting some, once we get drawings and things, those are all going to be available to you uh, that you can see more, uh, more in front of you what, what this all looks like, all right? So uh, just kind of a quick update this morning, but again, to be redundant, uh, please be uh, joining us in seeking the Lord in this time, all right? Hey, we started a uh, journey together uh, last week in the book of Matthew, and I'm really excited about this. I hope you are as well as we kind of unpack um, this, this letter to uh, the church back then, to a group of people back then, to you and I today. And uh, we're, like I said, we're going to finish out chapter one today, but before we do that, let's look at just a little bit of a review, take a little bit of a review together uh, about uh, this this book, what we talked about last week. First of all, you'll see the graphic has changed. You're like, wait a minute, is that gonna, that wasn't the one from last week. And, and just very quickly, this was something that, that I, I was kind of burdened with. I went to our uh, communications director and I said, you know, it's really about the face of uh, the lion because in Ezekiel 1, it speaks of the face of the lion, the face of the eagle, the, the man, the face of the ox. And can we get kind of something a little closer, even though that other one last week was really, really cool. Uh, so we landed on this one, and this is, uh, this is the one we're going to go with, all right? So just in case you were wondering, a little bit of context. Leading up to Matthew, from the last book of the Old Testament up until the first book of the New Testament, a little bit of review, roughly 400 years, uh, many historians call it the silent period. This was this period of time where uh, God was not speaking. Right? He wasn't saying anything. Uh, prophets weren't hearing from him and speaking on his behalf. And really, it was a way of, of God saying, hey, I'm, I'm preparing you for a major announcement. A major announcement. What was that major announcement? The Messiah is coming. The Savior of the world is coming. Jesus, who will save men and women of their sins, is coming. All right, so approximately 400 years. Uh, Matthew, as all the disciples, leaves everything uh, to follow Jesus. He leaves everything. Uh, he speaks of that a little bit in his gospel, his letter in Matthew 9. Luke speaks more specifically to that. 
Uh, he left his uh, business. He left friends, family. Now, he didn't have many friends because he was a tax collector. Tax collectors were cheats. Tax collectors skimmed off the top. Tax collectors lied. And so it's ironic that he wrote the 100% truth and honesty in this letter. Matthew wrote what he saw. He wrote what he heard. He was with Jesus. You can understand why so many people even today still struggle with that, knowing who he was. So even especially back then, they struggled with believing him because he was known as a liar. He had built a reputation. All tax collectors did. But Matthew is the first book in the New Testament, and one of the big reasons for that uh, is there's some debate whether he was the first one to write or was it Mark. But there is no debate that Matthew is the first book because he connects the Old Testament so well. Better than any New Testament writer, better than any gospel writer, he connects the Old Testament to the New Testament, quoting Scripture. Why? Because mainly he's writing to Jews. He wants them to know that Jesus is the Christ. He is the Messiah, and he has come. He is Yeshua. He is the reason that we can have eternal life. And so to do that, Matthew, unlike any other of the gospel writers, he begins his, uh, his letter with the genealogy of Jesus. Why? Because that was the best way to prove that Jesus, the Messiah, was who he says he was. A genealogy was the way to prove that. If anybody was to come and say, I am the Messiah, claim to be the Messiah, he better come from the seed of Abraham. He better come from the seed of King David. And Jesus did that. And Matthew wants to make sure that people understand that. The Jews reading this at the time understand that, and that we all do as well. He is, he is the Christ. And yet through that genealogy, our big takeaway last week was the fact that Jesus did not identify with his, uh, his family tree in the sense that that defined him. That did not define him. His definement, his, his identity came through God the Father. His purpose, his mission all came through God the Father. You might remember the quote that we ended with, the heritage that you have received is of far less importance, of far less importance than the legacy that you leave. A challenge for us. Jesus was defined and identified in the Father. Our identity as sons and daughters of the Most High King is just that in Him, not in what other people think. That can be important, but it's defined in Christ and who he is. And our legacy is far more important than the heritage that we receive. All right, so that was the first part of Matthew. Now we want to finish out Matthew, the birth of Jesus, um, Christmas and March, right? That's where we're going to go this morning. Before we do that, would you join me in prayer? Father, as we open up your word, first of all, we just thank you for it. Lord Jesus, we recognize there are people across your planet that do not have a copy of God's Word, and yet, Father, we take it for granted. So often it sits on our shelves or in a drawer or under a bed, and we can't even find it, or we got to wipe the dust off of it. And Lord, there's so many people that would do anything to have a copy of your Word. And so, Father, as we open it up today, we praise you for it. We thank you for the truth. As your disciple Matthew wrote with so much passion and authenticity of what he saw, what he heard you when he, when he followed you, when he walked with you, Lord. All through that this morning, may you open up our minds and more importantly, open up our hearts to that, Lord Jesus. We thank you for your powerful word the truth that, that is within it, the life that comes through it. We pray these things in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Matthew chapter 1, let's read verses 18 to the end of the chapter. We're going to go back and bring some context. There is so much in this here this morning. We're going to link it to Luke chapter 1. And Lord willing, we're going to get through all of this this morning. If you're taking notes this morning, you'll see four takeaways from uh, that we have on there this morning. Our goal is to get through that. If we don't, we'll finish it up next week, right? No big deal. We'll see where the Holy Spirit leads us here this morning. But we're going to read through this. We're going to bring some context. We'll jump to Luke 2, and then we'll come back 
to Matthew chapter 1, all right? Here we go. Verse 18 says this. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had a mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save the people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name of Jesus Back at verse 18, you'll see that it says he was pledged to be married. Other versions, translations will say he was espoused, his espoused wife, betrothed. All of that means the same thing. It was a formal agreement between him, Joseph, and her, Mary. Basically, they were already married. This could happen one of two ways. Uh, traditionally, they could come uh, they could be arranged, it could be arranged marriage where the, the family just says, this is who you're going to marry. Um, like it or not, this is who we're bringing uh, to you to marry. Or it could be a purchase. Uh, imagine that, right? There's a purchase made. We're going to basically buy her for you, son. Um, do things the right way and live long and prosper, right? I mean, one of these two arrangements, one of these two ways was typically how they would come together, but they were basically married as we read this. The Bible says in verse 18, before they came together, in other words, before they were intimate, before they had that uh, honeymoon evening where they stayed up all night and watched movies, right? I think that's what happens. But it says during the first year, or the year of espousement. So typically what would happen here is when they would agree to this, basically you're married, during that first year, the uh, husband, the man would leave. He would leave basically for a year. He would go to his father's house, and he would build an addition. Joseph was a carpenter. So we can imagine what that addition might look like. I mean, he really probably got into this. He said, oh, I can't wait for Mary to see this. I mean, look what I'm building. Dad, look at this table. Look at this, this crib. Look at this room. I mean, she's going to love it. And so they would go away. He would go away. He would build this addition. And then after a year, sometime after a year, usually within that 365 days that year, the groom and his groomsmen would come back. Could be any time during the day. Most of the time it was at night. The groom and the groomsmen would come back and the trumpet would be playing and they would be yelling, behold, the bridegroom cometh. And as that is happening, the bride and her bridesmaids are getting ready. They've got their lamps. They've got the oil in the lamps. The lamps are lit. If he comes back at night, the bride will be ready so that she can go with him. He will take her back to his father's house where he has built that addition. We just pause for a second. What a beautiful picture of what Jesus will do when he comes back to take his bride, the church. If you're taking notes this morning, jot down John chapter 14. Jesus himself says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms or many mansions, and, and I've gone away to prepare a place for you. And if I have done that, I'm going to take you with me to that place that I have prepared. And you know where that is. Jesus will come back. He will come back and he will take his bride. The bridegroom will take his bride, the church, to be with him. So traditionally, this would have been uh, where Joseph would take Mary back to his father's house. They would consummate the marriage. They would uh, quit watching movies and do what you do on your honeymoon. And then after seven days, obviously this didn't happen, but after seven days they would come out and the bride would come out. There would be cheering, friends and family would be cheering for them. But what did happen? Joseph finds out that Mary's pregnant. 
He's like, well, how did that happen? You can imagine if that was you guys, what is the first thing you think of? There's another guy involved. She's had an affair, right? You see in verse 19, Joseph did not want to expose her, so his plan was to divorce her quietly. Now, here, here's how this would work. You can read this, take a note this morning, jot down Deuteronomy chapter 22. You can read this. If this happened, basically one of two things would happen. If the woman who was pledged to be married, which in this case, by all rights, was married, was raped, the accuser, he would be found, taken out to the center of town, and he would be stoned to death. The woman in this case who was found not to be at fault, she was raped against her will. There was no sin committed. But if it was deemed that it was an adulterous affair, both the woman and the man would be would be stoned to death. In this case, Joseph had every right to expose her. He had every right to. And if he chose to, he would have taken her to the authorities. They, she would have gone out into the center of town. They would have brought a box out into the center of town. They would have filled it up with manure. Basically, it would be, the depth would be somewhere between her knees and her waist. She would stand in that manure, stand in that box. I can say from experience as a dairy farmer, I have stood in manure. It is not fun. Enough said, but they wouldn't end it there. People from the community would come out, and they would begin to stone her until she was killed. She would be put to death. Look what it says in verse 19, though. It says that Joseph was faithful to the law. It says that Joseph was a just man. In other words, he had both morality and he was merciful. That is a rare combination. Why? Because many times somebody is found to be moral, but it's really for their own benefit. It's to support themselves. It's to take care of themselves. It's, it's all about their own life, and in the process of that, they'll destroy others. They'll belittle others. Belittle others. They will not tolerate others. They will expose others. Or on the other side of that, you can be merciful without any morality. To the point where, for instance, you can tolerate sin. It's okay. God is love. God will forgive you. But yet to have both. The Bible makes it very clear that Joseph was a just man. He had that perfect blend of both morality and the gift of mercy. And he extended that to Mary. John chapter 8. Again, you take a notes, jot this down. Beautiful picture of this. In John chapter 8, let me paraphrase, you can read it later. The first 11 verses, Jesus is teaching. When he's teaching, people came. When Jesus spoke, people listened. And as much as he was maligned and made fun of, and especially in the north not wanted, up near Jerusalem, people came. And this is a, another example of that. He's in the temple, he's teaching, and here come the Pharisees, the teachers of the law. They had it all here, but they had nothing here. They believed what they had read. They, they followed it to a T. They did, 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 did exactly the way the law had said, but they didn't have the heart for Jesus. It was always a battle in Jesus' ministry. So they're like, again, we're going to get him. He can't get out of this one. He thought we got, he got us last time. We got him this time. What do they do? They bring this lady who was caught in an adulterous affair, adulterous relationship. They begin quoting Deuteronomy chapter 22 to Jesus. Hey, Jesus, the Mos Moses' law said this. Here's what you need to do. We need to stone her. We've got the box. We've got the poop ready. Let's get her out there. The stones are ready. We're going to start chucking them. Jesus is writing in the dirt. Not really sure what he's doing, what he's writing. My guess is he's probably like, gee whiz, God, not again. Why do you continually put me in this position? I don't think he's writing that. He's writing something. They're questioning in him. They're pushing him. Jesus, what are you going to do, teacher? You know what the law is. Jesus eventually stands up and says one of the most profound things in Scripture. I love this. I can envision him looking right in their eyes with that mercy and grace that only he can possess. And he says, whoever of you has sinned, why don't you throw the first stone? Can you imagine their response? 
Billy's over here. Oh, I, 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 just, I just yelled at my mom this morning. I can't do anything. And John's over here and says, yeah, I, I thought about really harming my brother because he's such an idiot, and I can't. And it's one by one, they realize, well, okay, that's not me. That's not me. And they just begin walking away and walking away and walking away. And eventually there's two left, two people. It's Jesus and the woman. He stands up, and he says, woman, has anybody condemned you? She says, no, sir, no one. And Jesus says, then I don't condemn you either. And he says, go. But he doesn't stop there, does he? He says, go and sin no more. Leave your life of sin. A perfect example of morality and having mercy. And that's what Joseph possessed. The Bible said he was a just man. He understood the law. Now, let's pause for a second and jump to Luke chapter 1. If you have your Bibles open, go to Luke chapter 1 with me. This is Joseph's perspective. All right, we'll come back to that in a minute. In Luke chapter 1, we see Mary's perspective now. And we need to link these two together. I think it's very important that we do that. Starting in verse 26, let me read a couple verses and we'll give some context and then finish out this section. Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 26, it says this, In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent an angel to Gabriel of Nazareth, uh, uh, the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Now, you notice in the very beginning it says the six months of Elizabeth's pregnancy. This is Mary's cousin. Uh, we'll see later in this, we know that she was barren. She could not have children. Her and her husband, Zachariah, had tried over and over and over again. They could not have children. And yet, God in his infinite mercy and grace and wisdom and perfection allows her to be pregnant. She's six months in. All right? And an angel comes. The Bible tells us who this angel was. It was Gabriel. He comes to Mary. He addresses her as such. You are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Some translations say you are blessed above all women. You know, over the years, over the centuries, really Mary has been maligned in so many ways. She's been put on a pedestal, mainly in the Catholic faith, put on this pedestal that, that puts her uh, in, in a place which almost is level with Jesus, the same uh, height as Jesus, if you will elevated to a place which would have made her very uncomfortable, even humiliated. Some forms of Catholicism has gone as far to adopt something called co-redemptrix. Co-redemptrix is where they, they nail her to the back of the cross, the same cross Jesus was on, and, and she is included in that redemptive process. She's included in redemption. Other religions, even Protestant uh, religions have maligned her in other ways. We know that Jesus is the only way, the truth, and the life. It, redemption only comes through Jesus. But yet this angel, Gabriel, says to her, you are highly favored. You are above all women. And Mary, the Lord is with you. You are blessed. There, she is not the way to salvation. It's only through Jesus. But isn't it interesting, if you ever want to know what Jesus was like as a child, wouldn't it be neat to talk to Mary when we get to heaven? Because what was he like, right? And what did he do? We know that he never sinned, so there was no such thing as terrible twos, right? Were they wonderful twos? Exciting twos? Crazy threes? We can ask her when we get there. Let's read on. Verse 29 says this, Mary was greatly troubled. They were troubled at it. She was troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son. You are to call his name Jesus. He will be great. He will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever and ever. How will this be, Mary asked. She asked the angel, since I'm a virgin. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One 
to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she was said to be unable to conceive. She's in her sixth month. For no word, if you're following along this morning and you've got a pen in hand, this is a great verse to underline, verse 37. For no word from God will ever fail. I hope you believe that this morning. And I hope you believe that in your own life. No word of God will ever fail fail. She was a virgin. In other words, she had never been with a man. She had never been intimate with a man. So she is trying to understand this as well. Now, Mary knew the law also. So she's processing this as the angel tells her this, knowing what Deuteronomy 22 says. I'm going to be killed. They're going to stone me to death. Nobody is going to believe me. Joseph especially, he won't believe me. There's something about Mary that we need to understand. The Bible doesn't really tell us. Remember last week we talked about Sarah, Rachel, and these were beautiful women, and the kings tried to steal them away from their husbands, and they lied and said, no, they're my sister, and just so that they didn't get killed so that they could have their wife and Abraham. Well, just say, say I'm, I'm, your, I'm your brother, and you're my sister. Right? We don't know that about Mary, but one of the things we do know is internally she was amazing. A beautiful woman internally. Most likely what drew Joseph to her. She knew God. She loved God. She wanted to follow God. She knew the Psalms. She read the Psalms. She wanted to serve him. You know what's interesting about all this? She was 16. Most scholars, historians believe she was a teenager. 15, most are landing on 16. 16 years old. You know what she says? Look at verse 38. Here's what she says. Mary says, I am the Lord's servant. She answered, may your words to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left. Basically, Mary is saying, Lord, my life is in your hands. Whatever you require of me, I will do. May your word be fulfilled. What maturity. How many of you can say that this morning? How many of you are willing to declare that? Lord, my life is in your hands. Your will be done. Whatever you have for me, Lord, I'm willing. Make it happen. In the good time, in the troubled times, especially in the troubled times, to say, Lord, my life is in your hands. Church, that is blind faith. That is blind faith. Mary had no idea how this was going to happen. She understood the law. In her mind, she's going to be killed. No one will believe her. How is this going to happen? God, whatever your will is, I will follow you. Did I mention she was 16? She was a teenager. I miss so much hanging out with teenagers Not the crazy parts where they drive me nuts and my hair starts turning colors, but just those moments where they smile, those moments where they teach. I've learned so much from young people. I miss that. Church, you ought to see what God is doing in our young people today here in Washington Lions Church. Teenagers are coming to Christ. Teenagers are growing in their faith. They want to know more. They're hungry for the Word of God. Our children's ministry... Our grade school kids are back here and they're lifting their hands and they're praising Jesus. Can I encourage you with that this morning? Moms and dads, go back and check it out. Actually, I've got a better idea. Go to our children's director, Kim Greenleaf, and say, hey, I would like to help back there. And you know part of that is because you want to see what's going on, but you want to help, you want to volunteer. Can I tell you, she'll do a happy dance. She will be ecstatic. She would love to have that conversation with you. But God is moving in our young people, church. And I know sometimes, moms and dads, that's hard to believe. That's hard to comprehend because we see them at home every single day. But God is moving. He's moving in uptown kids on Sunday mornings. He's moving in uptown kids through our Awana program. He's moving in Fusion 127, and it's a beautiful thing. But that can be hard. I know our youngest child, he's nine, and honestly, it's like, I have the conversation multiple times a day. 
The phrase, what were you thinking, is so common to me. I, I say it all the time, and I forget that he probably wasn't thinking, Brian, but I keep asking the same question. Why did you do that? It makes no sense. To a 50-year-old, yes. To a 90-year-old, maybe it did. And I go to Kim, our children's director. It's the nice thing about being married to your children's director. You're talking all the time. And I'm like, Kim, what are you teaching them back there? I mean, give him something. Maybe go to the part where it says, kids, obey your mother and father, honor them. Maybe kind of send that his way a little bit, right? I'm like, really? And then over the last month, I've had three different people come up to me. Three different people and say, Pastor Ryan, I just got to tell you this. On three separate occasions. And church, can I tell you, our leaders are professing the name of Jesus and people are getting saved in these rooms, in this building. The Bible is being preached in this place. And these three peoples come up, people come up to me three different occasions and say, Pastor Brian, I just got to tell you this. Every time we pray, Willie wants to pray too. And I have to stop him and say, what? He's the dude with the black fro, dark skin, glasses, right? We're talking about the same one here. Looks just like me. Talking about the same one, right? He says, yes, I know who Willie is. And, and they're like, he wants to pray. I can't get him to pray at home. And he'll first pray for the lesson and the teacher, and then every time without fail, he prays for his dad. He said, God, help dad to preach well. Now, I get prayed over by some of our elders every single Sunday morning that I preach. Pastor or Ozzie does. Pastor Corey, whoever is preaching, gets prayed over. And that is incredible. Boy, there's something different about a nine-year-old to where I can just look at the enemy and say, yeah, not today, buddy. you got nine-year-olds coming against you now. You're done. God is moving. Here's a teenager who got it, wanted to follow Jesus. Are you willing to declare that this morning? Let's get back to Matthew chapter 1. Go back to Matthew 1. Let's finish out this chapter this morning. Mary is willing to obey. She's willing to do whatever God wants her to do. Verse 20. We're just going to skim through this. Moses, or Moses, Joseph is de uh, uh, processing all of this. He has decided, you know what? I'm not going to expose her. I'm going to divorce her quietly. We're going to do this and just uh, nobody has to know. He f goes to sleep. There's a dream. He has a dream and, and the angel of the Lord, God sends one of his angels, maybe Gabriel, the text doesn't tell us, but comes to him in a dream. And in verse 21 tells Joseph, listen, it's okay. Mary is going to have a child. It's not through any of these means, not through adultery. She was not taken against her will. The Holy Spirit is going to, he created her, God created her, so he has the ability to change the way DNA works. I mean, Mo, uh, jo Joseph, I keep saying Moses, Joseph and Mary are not, you know, they're not biologists, they're not geneticists, they don't understand how this is going to work. And, he, and the, the, the angel of the Lord is telling both of them, the Holy Spirit is going to take care of this. God, through his spirit, is going to make this happen. Don't be afraid. And Joseph, you are going to give him this name, Jesus. Emmanuel, meaning God with us. Most likely what she was, he's quoting Isaiah chapter 7, this conversation Isaiah the prophet had with King Ahaz about signs. Ahaz is like, no, I'm not going to do that. You can read it for yourself. And in verse 14, the prophet says, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and he will be called Emmanuel. The angel of the Lord is telling this to Joseph. Now, not only is Joseph trying to process all of this, but he knew tradition as well, especially for the firstborn son, carrying on the name of the family. He got to pick the name. He wanted to pick a name that had a strong meaning. The meaning of names was everything back then, not so much with us today. Some of you look at meanings, but for the most part, we pick a name that sounds good, and we don't know anybody else with that name that drove us nuts. Okay, let's give him that name. But for back then, Joseph and Mary are looking for one that has deep, deep meaning. So not only is Joseph like, how is this going to happen? I don't even get to name him. Because the angel says, you're going to call him Jesus. What does Joseph do? He wakes up from his dreams. Some of you have woken up from dreams. I've woken up from dreams, very weird dreams, like that was crazy. Tell somebody about it, and what do we do? Move on, right? 
Probably have another one the next night. What does Joseph do? Joseph wakes up. He takes Mary home as his wife. Blind faith. Blind faith. I have no idea, Joseph, saying how this is going to work, but I'm going to trust you. Joseph is basically saying, Lord, my life is in your hands. Whatever you require of me, I will do. May your will be done. What maturity. Joseph was not 30, 40, 45 years old in the, in the church. A deacon, an elder, studied the word. Most likely he was 18 or 19, many, maybe 20 tops. In all likelihood, here we have two teenagers that love God. Don't understand what God is saying completely, where it's all going to go, but they're saying almost blindly, God, I will follow you. I will trust you and believe that it's all somehow going to work out for your glory. Kristen, I'm going to ask you to come on up. We're going to finish out this next week. If you have your sermon notes and you're looking at those fill-ins, it's going to drive you crazy like, oh, i, I got to write one. Come back next week. We're going to fill this out and really look at some of the more of the application, jump in to chapter 3. But let me challenge us with this. As you see, if you're, you're, you're taking notes, you see there's really four takeaways from Joseph and Mary. But the biggest one that I want us to see this morning is their dependence on God. Church, all of us go through difficult times together. Together, sometimes individually. We can't understand it. We can't make sense of it. Maybe you're even right now, you're going through something. Been dealing with this decision you got to make strife at home you're 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 dealing with a temptation that is just constantly eating you up and you find more times than not you are giving in the bible tells us that no temptation is more than you can bear god will always every time give you a way to rise above it always and yet we continue to struggle i ask you this morning what area of your life what area of your life right now are you saying, God, I'm just going to give it to you. May your will be done. Whatever you want me to do with this, God, I'm, I'm, use me. Lord, your will. What part of your life do you need to humbly come before God and say, God, my life is in your hands. One of the hardest things to understand here is the supernatural. We'll build this out a little bit more next week. Because we can't put our hands on that. It's just, I, I can't, how does that work? And that's how our God works. And that's where faith can come from, be, uh, even grow, and be even more, uh, more great in our life because of what God does supernaturally. We'll unpack next week this idea of what's called special revelation. We can't even fully understand it. We can't sometimes even see it. But God does it. He created the world from nothing. Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, he created heaven and earth from nothing. The world says nothing, bumped into nothing, and everything happened. And yet our God created it all. Which takes more faith? What part of your life this morning do you need to just say, God, my life is in your hands? I just want to take some time and not rush through this as we close this morning. Just take some time before the Lord. Maybe you want to do it individually right where you are. Maybe you want to take a bold leap of faith and say, you know what? I want to come forward. I want to just kneel here at this place, and I just want to be quiet away and just go before the Lord and say, God, I need you in this area of my life. There will be people here, myself. I see Pastor Ozzy, some of our elders, ladies. We, we'll come up and pray with you. If you just want to be by yourself, we'll leave you be. But let's just take this time and go before the Lord and allow him to search our heart. May we have the faith of Joseph, the faith of Mary.
and the trust that says, I'm blindly coming into this, God. I'm giving it to you. Will you use me for your glory? Can we just do that this morning? If you would just, and right where you are, if you're at home this morning, would you close your eyes, bow your head just right where you are and just kind of separate from everything that's going to happen today. It'll, it'll take place eventually. Just allow the Holy Spirit to dig deep into your heart. As you are continuing to pray, I'm going to take it a step further. Maybe you don't want to come forward, but you want prayed over, and we don't need specifics. God knows the heart. He knows the situation better than you do. Maybe you just want to boldly say, I want God to have my life. I want him to be in control. I want him to have his way, not only in this one area, but in my, my life this morning. I'm struggling, and I need God to have control. I'm going to ask you to stand right where you are. We're going to pray over you. doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. This is a declaration that says the enemy has had his way too long, maybe in this area, or maybe just generally speaking. I just, I just need, kind of need you to take over. Just stand right where you are. We're going to pray for you. Who would say that this morning? If you're at home, I encourage you to do the same. Just stand this morning and say, God, I need you to be Lord of my life. I want the faith of Mary. I want the faith of Joseph. I'm going in blind, but God, you know. Who else? Say, that's me this morning. We've got to quit trying to do it on our own, trying to get everything right before we come to God. We come to God to get it right. He's the one. Who makes it right it's through his son who died on the cross that we can be freed of the bondage of sin and the enemy's way in our life he has no no power in us the power that jesus was given through god to be raised from the dead is a power that is within us the bible tells us who else god your way your will in my life lord jesus you see these men and women standing but even more importantly, God, you see their heart. You see what we can't even see in us. Oh, God, would the power of your spirit come on these men and women this morning. And may we all realize that this battle that we're fighting, evil, not that when we don't fight with the weapons of this world, but our, our weapons are of divine nature. And Lord, when we take these battles into the heavenly realms and your angel army comes on our side, we win. Lord, we give you this battle this morning. May we be the men and women you've created us to be. Father, I pray for anyone who is in this place or watching this morning that does not have a relationship with you. Father, that's where it starts. May this be the morning that they say yes to your message and welcome you in, receive you in as Lord and Savior of their life. To be freed of the bondage of sin is to receive Jesus as Savior and Lord. That's where it starts. Culminated by eternity with you in your heaven. Lord, have your way in us. Oh, we love you, Lord Jesus, and we can say that only because you have first loved us. Amen, amen. Would the rest of you, if you're able, please join us and stand as we close our service. Just as you leave today, if anyone prayed to receive Jesus or you would like to know more about that, I would love to have that conversation with you. I'll be up here in the front. 
If you have received Jesus, we have materials in the back. Next steps, hey, what do I do now? Sometimes you're like, oh, okay, I got Jesus in my life, great, but now what do I do? We have some materials we'd love to give you. We could uh, put that in your hands as well. But what all of us, purpose to be the hands and feet of Jesus, and to do that, we need to allow him to be Lord of our life. Be our light, be our guide. Amen. Father, go with us today. May we be your hands and feet. May you be on our lips. May you be in our actions. May you be in our motives. May you be in our thoughts. And Lord, may you receive all of the praise. We pray in the strong and powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Have a great rest of your Sunday.